it over to Jody. I just want to start with a trigger warning and say <laughs> we're all experienced presenters and we're used to having a lot more time to put things together. Um, and we uh, did not email out the slides to you because we were still editing them about 20 minutes ago. So um, <laughs> it's it's a. Uh, um, we're doing our best to at least start a dialogue and see how we can help you. And so back to you, Jody. Yeah, thank you, Virginia. And many of you who are joining us today uh, are maybe learning about the Alliance for Massage Therapy Education for the first time. And so briefly, I will say that the mission of the Alliance is to serve massage therapy and bodywork educators. And that is why we are coming to you today. Uh, and so we are glad to have you. And again, feel free to jump onto our website at afmte.org. Let's get right into the heart of our program. Uh, this is the very simple agenda, but it is chock full of information. We're going to be talking about considerations for your school and your program as it relates to the current state of affairs regarding COVID-19. Once we talk about these considerations, we're gonna move into some alternatives for you. Uh, many schools at this time have been told uh, within the last 72 hours that they are gonna be shutting down uh, at least till the end of the month. And it is time to look at some alternatives for learning. It is time to and specifically how we serve our students and how we serve our teachers. Uh, and the Alliance is going to be a resource for you as well there. And finally, we're gonna talk about some active learning strategies that are outside the classroom. Uh, and so uh, this should be uh, a very informative and inspiring uh, webinar for you to take away. And really our intention is that even if you get one good idea, we're gonna be really excited for you and to help you. Learn. And, and we're here as the Alliance to support you with this, with questions. And I'm gonna turn the program now over to Virginia and she's gonna to speak to our next slide, which is uh, more specifics about considerations for your school and program. Dr. Cohen. Uh, so thanks again, Jody. Um, so we and uh, as we go through our presentation today, we're going to be tag teaming back and forth. Um, so you'll get a little bit of insight into some of the improv that's going on. Um, we're not aiming to induce panic or or buy into anybody's panic, but really taking a proactive and planning approach to this. So just very quickly, in case anybody has not read a newspaper and not talked to anybody recently, that COVID-19 is it's spreading, it's a pandemic, it's spread all across the planet. And, and there are risks to health and they're different depending on where you are geographically located and where you or your students or your clients have traveled. And so there's a risk of transmission at the school and this risk applies to students, faculty and staff mm -hmm. and then also to clinic clients as the students are working on clinics. But secondly, and we've been hearing from um, from schools and uh, and massage educators, uh, as well as I might add my friends elsewhere in higher education, they're all facing the same thing. There's risk for transmission offsite. So students who go out on clinical rotations, and this is the physical therapy programs are running into this, uh, medical schools are running into this, and then also within your community. And so in looking at the, fa the fact that your school is part of your community and, and you provide a good service by providing massage, but we're looking at, um, at the rates of infection and one of the biggest challenges is that uh, between exposure, uh, the incubation period, and actually onset of symptoms or diagnosis, this for many cases is asymptomatic. So that's one of the things that increases the risk. But then also risk to family members, roommates, and neighbors. And so if any of you, I don't think you are, but if any of you are at residential schools, one of the major reasons that uh, colleges and universities are closing down for the remainder of the semester is the shared living situations and risks in shared bathrooms and dining facilities facilities and things like that. So there is going to be a large movement of people and it's already in place across the country of college students heading home um, and people trying to get back from abroad. So uh, at least in some areas, there are very few cautions and in others, we're seeing uh, departments of health being proactive. And what that means is that over the next three weeks, if we do start to 
socially distance ourselves. Um, we will see in the next two weeks an increase in rates of infection, and that should taper off if we're successful. So that's something to keep in mind. But clearly, if you haven't been given a, a mandate or a directive to, uh, to close your school, that's something that you want to consider in terms of the risks. Um, and so this slide is really just for reference and, and certainly even to provide some rationale for students. Um, this is uh, looking at um, the burden estimates from the 2017-2018 flu season. Flu is being compared to COVID-19 and it's not, uh, we won't really get into the pathophysiology here, but it really gives us an idea of the rates of infection and in communities that have not, in, in countries that have not been proactive, uh, we're seeing much more, much wider spread. Um, and so I'm going to turn this, I think, back over to Jody, just to ask if you have anything else to add before we move on to the next section. This slide here is an example um, of a handout that is available for you for free download, uh, and that is also from the CDC. And it reemphasizes really uh, what we teach in our schools already, uh, which is you know, sanitary hand washing. <clears throat> and so, uh, yes, these are. Uh, we are here for you to remind you that, of course, I don't know what your favorite method is, whether it's two rounds of happy birthday, um, the ABC song, or Old MacDonald, one verse, uh, but that 20 seconds of sanitary hand washing with soap and water is what is still our best defense uh, against uh, this current pandemic. And it's back to you, uh, Virginia. Um, okay, and so in this next section, uh, we're going to actually pass on to Don Ho to really talk from her perspective at Compta, um, what uh, questions he's been getting from schools and advice. So over to you, Don. Okay, thank you so much, ladies. Yes, everyone, I'll be uh, facilitating the next few slides. And as Virginia said, in, in particular, as it relates to um, the mounting inquiries and questions that the Compta office received um, throughout this week, it, as I said earlier, it was really striking to me how Monday or Tuesday, there were just a, a few emails coming in and a few people thinking about contingency plans based on what they felt like their state government might do. But then by Wednesday, by Thursday, and by Friday, it really just, um, you know, was was an onslaught of alarm and emergency and what should we do, what can we do? Um, and so, you know, I hope, as Jody said, you can take away some, you know, valuable things from what to consider from a compliance perspective in particular, but in general, best practices. Um, and with this first consideration, should in-person contact be minimized? I think the simple answer <clears throat> is yes. We're seeing major employers um, asking employees or making it possible for employees to work from home so that people do not have to congregate in their typical uh, shared spaces together. Schools are doing that with staff. Um, recommendations by states and municipalities certainly are limiting public gatherings, curtailing hours um, related to public businesses. And as we're seeing with our schools, some of them are being mandated to close um, with minimal notice. Some are being mandated to curtail certain aspects of their program, whether that be the clinic or hands-on aspects of the training. So in terms of some of the possible alternatives, yes, suspending classes may be an alternative that you want to consider. Maybe that's all together a pause like many of our K through 12 schools are having to do. No classes being conducted for a period of time. Um, what we're seeing is that more of our schools are really making concerted efforts to try to transition to some virtual learning opportunities, um, maybe adjusting their schedules so that they're uh, kind of bundling some academic online learning in the short term and then holding hands-on in-person classes maybe in a few weeks when there's more clarity about the um, options of being together again, uh, making online learning <laughs> platforms available, creating opportunities for individualized assignments. Those are just some of the things that have um, come to light here in these last few days. If you go on to the next slide, we will look at um, some other 
resources available to you, places to look for guidance. Um, you probably know some of these already, and as Jody said, these links will be available after the presentation as well, but the CDC has some, some very helpful resources, the U.S. Department of Education. Some of our schools have received information directly from their third-party servicers with financial aid, some from their accrediting agencies. Um, Comta put out a communication to our school community. Again, that was earlier in the week, and at that point we were saying, you know, you might want to consider uh, making some contingency plans and do what you need to do to keep your community safe. And essentially, at this point, we're kind of in a accommodations as needed state. Um, but the World Health Organization is another valuable link for you, as are your local health departments. Other schools in your community, especially vocational schools, hands-on schools, integrative health and health science schools would be great allies um, and partners, partnerships to establish if you haven't already. Your accrediting bodies, as I said, Comta, we're making ourselves available as a resource, certainly for our schools, but we would offer ourselves as a resource to any of you who might have questions or need some feedback on plans you're considering, and again, things to keep in mind with accommodations you might be making. Your state massage therapy boards can be great resources for any impacts to the licensure process. Um, and again, that Center for Disease Control, I, I can't point to them enough in terms of um, their expertise and broad perspective that they can provide to all of us. Go on to the next slide. I'll speak a little bit about some specific um, policies that support the content that you're uh, considering shifting the delivery method. And this is um, kind of the additional information that I've provided to some schools just as, um, you know, food for thought. And again, additional things to consider in addition to the content and how you're gonna make that available to your students. That's certainly the central focus, focus and how you're going to deliver that in an effective way. And you also want to consider things like, how will you monitor attendance and participation? And I've been guiding our schools to create virtual learning opportunities that enable faculty to maintain some kind of attendance that is consistent with what the normal schedule would be. So for example, if you normally meet three days a week in person um, for six hours, you know, two three-hour sessions each week, ensure that you can somehow track attendance that would be as closely in alignment with that as possible. Um, again, whether that's through sign-in sheets online, um, Google Hangouts, where you can actually take attendance of people that are participating, like on a go-to meeting, um, and ensure participation, whether that's through a chat box, or through, again, kind of direct visual means with webcam sharing. Um, also consider the time limits and time frames that relate to your class and course completions and that timeline as you're leading to graduation. I think uh, all of you probably understand the SAP, Satisfactory Academic Progress, and hopefully, again, design your virtual learning methods so that you can maintain a consistency with how you measure and monitor that satisfactory progress. If you have to provide tuition refunds for students that just can't accommodate um, alternative delivery methods, then, you know, please follow your own policies in doing that. That's what your accrediting agencies are going to look to, that you have followed your policy or that you have made accommodations that cover <clears throat> all of your student body, not just one person. Again, that consistency to everyone. Having said that, you might have to make unique accommodations for students with disabilities, but please do so with some kind of precedent and as much consistency as you can provide. In terms of students who are internationally um, able to come to your program with student visas, CVIS, the Student Exchange Visitor Program, um, is gonna be a go-to resource for you related to any questions you have about their abilities to come and go in and out of the states and what you might need to do to report that appropriately. Next slide, please. 
So the planning and implementation, I'm going to restate some of the things um, that I've already stated, but also hopefully add just a few key components about especially communication. Um, that's one of the first things that I've recommended to all of our schools is to please notify your accrediting body if you are making accommodations to your delivery method, just a simple notification. Some agencies might have formal um, reports that you submit for that kind of notification. For some, an email in writing will be sufficient, but notify us, let us know what you're planning to do and give us even just some general details about what that looks like. And please provide notification to your faculty to your staff and your students. If you can give them heads up, that's ideal. But if you have to notify them with very short notice, you can always say, here's your notification. We'll be following up with more details. Um, and if you can get some kind of consent, you know, some acknowledgement of understanding and agreement from your staff, students and faculty, that they understand this is a very unique situation, requires unique accommodations, um, and that they will, you know, work with whatever is being designed to help them continue and complete the pr um, program efficiently and effectively. I like to always say, you know, acknowledge and appreciate the flexibility that everyone is willing to extend in this unique time that we're in. And in terms of a collective approach and cooperation with other state health profession schools and training programs, you're going to hear this um, throughout the presentation as well. You know, we're in this together and as much as we can all work together to help support each other and share um, what's working for us, find out what's working for other schools in your areas, and again, take a collaborative approach. Um, that's, I think, going to help everybody and help everyone feel uh, as comforted and as at ease as possible about this, uh, you know, bit of a scary time that we're in and lots of unknowns. So um, I think that's, uh, that wraps me up. You can go on to the next slide. Okay, thanks, Dawn, very much. So I'm going to jump in here and uh, go start through our next section, which is to first look at logistics. And we realize, uh, certainly for those of you who are in Susan Salvo's uh, Facebook group, uh, and there's been a lot of chatter, people are at different stages of preparation and action. So in separating out, the first part is how can you start to navigate through logistics to get through the next couple of weeks? And then after that, we'll look at just some active learning strategies for optimal engagement. So um, what's important to keep in mind is that you have materials already. You have uh, textbooks, resources that you're using in the classroom, and depending on your publisher, there are ancillaries that students can access online. And the online are games, quizzes. Uh, if you don't, oftentimes people don't use the slide decks, but this might be an opportunity to, to pull them down if they match your book. Um, some uh, books have case studies as well. And so in looking at ancillaries, and if you're going to have a gap between when, when you lack that in-person interaction, and that's really what we're speaking to here, and uh, need to get things set up so you can really reconnect with students, this can just help the habit to have them complete some games, complete some quizzes, be honest with them and just say, we want to, you, you can use these resources to just keep learning happening. So that's one resource you already have. The other thing you have that we always forget about is you've got your course documents. And if you're old school and you have a course manual that you physically hand to your instructors, you still are going to have the syllabus, which is the course goals and objectives and grading scheme, and the course outline, and that's your learning plan. And the course outline is the part that is most likely to change, whether you're uh, delaying a little bit any of your activities or you need to reorder them. So I, I do know that there are some faculty that are front-loading didactic content so they can go back and do clinical work later. And that may be one possibility depending on how things go. And so looking at the course outline and maybe even taking it week by week, and if you are moving into a virtual environment uh, instead of week, maybe start uh, using module, that's a little more common of a term, to start to keep things in, in, in bite-sized portions so that you can start to work through. And so uh, if you already have your slide decks, making the, um, making the slides available through an electronic platform for students is the easiest thing to do, a learning management system, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Whatever handouts you have, whatever assignments you have, the, they will likely need 
to be tweaked if it doesn't involve face-to-face -face interaction. But you have material to work with. So again, going out and trying to buy something at this point, you know, the K-12 uh, community has had uh, their um, alternative curriculum for snow days and other things. Most of them have purchased something a long time ago and are just implementing. And so, you know, certainly around here, I'm in Rockland County, New York, we're seeing kids being sent home with that. That's great. We're not designed for that. We're, we're very much a people professional education um, approach. So something else to think about is open education resources and the acronym, acronym is OER. And there's a big, uh, I don't want to say society, but but a movement in higher ed to make uh, uh, any of your materials available more widely. So noodling around a little bit to look at OER, there definitely are faculty in basic sciences that are jumping onto that train and faculty in sociology and humanities. So you may be able to find some resources that other faculty are putting out there for free. So that really is going to add to the materials that you have at at really no cost. And something else I want you to bear in mind is we're all here on a Sunday. Um, your faculty are going to bear the brunt of this right here, right now. Administrators, you've been uh, answering questions for several days now, but faculty are are going to be really busy and, and may be very stressed. And so they're going to need to maintain contact with students, deal with whatever they're dealing with at home in their own family situations, and work double time to get things up and running. So we suspect, and I say we, this is just higher ed folks, we suspect the reason some of the larger institutions uh, and colleges and universities are closing for the remainder of the term is just the effort to get everything set up to move it online. It probably is easier mm -hmm. for many courses to stay there. But do remember that there is um, there is a medical student out there on an OBGYN rotation that you know may be losing learning opportunity. There are dental school clinics, there are physical therapy programs, and so we look more broadly at health sciences and look for ideas. So if, if I had to give you one analogy, I would say, imagine that you are a dentist teaching dental students. Think about the difference between what uh, the, the content learning that goes on compared to actually putting your hands in someone's mouth. And if you look at that and think, the hands in the mouth is really the mechanical part of, of their practice, but there's a lot more cerebral practice that can go on. And, and so bear that in mind because there's a lot of not hands-on, hands-on learning that you can put together. So you've got material. So the next piece, if you are at a community college, you can take a nap for about five minutes and, and then we'll wake you up. Um, but if you're at a school that does not have uh, a learning management system or online capability, then um, finding something is not that difficult. Uh, there are a lot of options and these options have expanded in, in the past, even within the past two years. So if you have something in place and you haven't used it, likely you do have IT support um, at the school and a lot of those folks can work remotely. And so finding your way around that system is going to be your challenge. Uh, if you don't have a system, there are open source these and, and the, the numbers or the um, uh, the options we have listed on this slide, it's just a small sampling of what's available. And I don't think any of us own stock in any of these companies. Um, but Moodle and Sakai are two open source platforms um, that can be customized. It requires IT help to do that. And so that's something to keep in mind if you're looking for open source, which is, by the way, free, or looking at retail options. And so these are just four of the retail options. Um, and there are some, I think, LearnDash integrates with WordPress. Um, but the retail options, the prices for these are based on volume. And so if you have a small program and you want to put three classes online, um, I think Thinkific is free for three classes and up to a certain limit of learners. Um, Teachable was the, uh, I sent around a, uh, or posted an email, that Teachable sent an email that they were um, willing to support institutes of higher education, but unfortunately a lot of massage programs don't qualify. Um, it probably has to do with your accreditation. But retail options, some of them are available for $79 a month. Um, so they're, and, and by the way, up to thousands of dollars. So in thinking about purchasing something, um, it, they're, they're all-in-one solutions. They come with a lot of whistles and bells on the higher end of the expenses that you might not need. So uh, uh, for several of them, you can sign up for free and find a way to navigate. And what's really terrific about these platforms is that there's a consistency to their layout so that you can find your way into the classroom 
and figure out where to go. And they the basic features are all the same, meaning the opportunities for uh, video, the opportunities for posting handouts. Um, a difference might be in face-to-face -face interaction. So supplementing face-to-face -face interaction, if you can't get it through a learning management system, you can you do Skype. I know in back in probably I don't know, the mid, mid aughts when um, Blackboard, which is a, a big retail option, uh, when Blackboard had a lot of system outages, I knew a lot of faculty that were teaching via Facebook. And so um, not that you would necessarily need to do that, but think about taking some care if you haven't already to get yourself in a platform so that you're not sending a message to your students, you're doing everything on the free and cheap. Um, free conference call is a way to connect people, uh, but that sends a message and it, that, that might not be value for your students. So just, just keep that in mind. And if there's anybody here who has not taken any online courses at all, I really encourage you to go to Coursera or Udemy. These are two big um, uh, clearinghouses of courses sign up for an active learning course that has nothing to do with massage. There are people who teach how to decorate a cake, people who teach crocheting and knitting, and all of those are active learning where you can start to just get yourself familiar with the classroom. And remember that when your students came to your, your class, your school at the beginning of the semester, they learned over time where to sit and how to behave. And, and that's exactly what needs to happen when people start to get oriented in the online environment. And I think that's why oftentimes people say, oh, it takes a long time to set these things up. It really is just finding the environment, getting yourself to a level of comfort or your faculty to a level of comfort so that you can make learning continue or help learning continue. And Virginia, I had a, a quick um, quick note to inject here. Um, one of the things that you know I've read is by Raymond Lindquist, and he said, "Courage is the power to let go of the familiar." Um, and so I'm putting in the chat box for our listeners right now the names of those two sites again uh, that they can maybe just play a little on Udemy uh, and on um, which was the other one that you recommended. The other one was Coursera, and I'm going to flip, uh, if I can't, I lost my cursor here, flip back to the other slide. Um, so and, and so Coursera, and those are just two. There are several others, and they these came to mind when uh, we were putting these slides together. But just an aside, and Jody and I talked about this last night, is that I... Um, I, I have a habit of signing up for all different kinds of statistics courses and data analysis and so on and so forth. And I signed up for a very famous one um, through a university that shall be remain nameless. And uh, the course was all studio shot videos. And so I realized I was just sitting watching people very passively. And so I took my tablet into the kitchen mm -hmm. and opened the fridge and started to cut up some onions and carrots and cabbage to make some soup. And all of a sudden the talking head stopped talking and I realized I had to run over to the screen, screen and take a pop quiz. So I answered the pop quiz and then it kept going. And so I had a lovely pot of soup at the end of the class, but it was really not at all engaging. And the activities were really divorced from the video and the videos were really, really long. So, uh, I learned a little bit about you know cooking and I tried to take the course a couple of times and then ran into a colleague and I said, you know, she said, yeah, I tried to take the course and it was just watching these, it was like watching talking heads. So uh, I, I'm looking at something that's, uh, that's more engaging that really has nothing to do with your work right now could probably really help. Uh, and you know, whether cake decorating is your thing or whatever it is, it's, you know, th there's a lot of options out there and these are just two. Um, so thanks, Jody. So now we're going to move into a couple of uh, just some terms that you may or may not be familiar with, and we'll break these down in the next couple of slides. Synchronous and asynchronous learning formats. And so synchronous means basically we're all learning at the same time together. You have synchronous learning in your classroom, assuming your students are awake, right? Um, and so synchronous learning is really useful for lectures, for demonstrations, and there are different ways to do this. Webcams, um, I did hear from someone whose computer didn't have a webcam, um, but you can do it versus, with live conference calls. And then also Skype. Um, and then asynchronous learning, this is gets more interesting because this is recorded lectures. And listed here are just three tools that you can use to record lectures for your students to play back at a different time. And so Camtasia is software that you can use to, um, it's, plug, it's a plugin for PowerPoint. 
or you can just capture your screen. And I use that a lot for my online uh, learning online platform now. And then Screencast-O-Matic does the same thing. These are, you have to pay for these. We have a resource in a little bit to help you find more economical ways to get this capability. And then another option is, and both of those, by the way, are for video, but another option is to record the audio separate from your slides for your lectures, and that will come in really handy for some of your students. So Audacity is free software that you can download from the internet, and it basically, if you don't have integrated ability to record an MP3 on your computer, you can download Audacity and do that. Uh, so these are just three of the options. I'm sure that some computers now come with software that already has that capability and maybe colleges and universities make options available to you. But the idea here is that you record lectures and then the students can play them back and then engage in other types of learning. So you're not learning face to face, you're not learning at the same time, but there's really a time lag. And so then scheduling the delivery, other ways to, to engage your students are having online course discussions and then also having time quizzes and tasks. So in, in breaking this down a little bit further, because I know for some people these terms are not really familiar, um, it, it's looking at, uh, again, whatever, whatever options you have available to yourself and saying for face-to-face you know, -face interactions, can you get people together for something like this? And then um, having that real time uh, that real time interaction with them, and then the, the challenge that you can't really have them work necessarily easily in small groups, but there is some technology that allows that. And when you have people in synchronous learning, what you want to think about is what content is essential to have them there real time. Because I have heard from people that their plan is to have everybody on video conference for the length of time that they would normally be in class. And so on the bottom left of the screen here, there's some considerations I want you to think about. And that is that what happens if your students have a family computer? And in, if your student is at home, likely other members of their family will either be working from home or their children might be going to school from home. And they may have one computer for the whole family or a computer for some purposes and uh, a tablet for others. And then uh, as one of my neighbors pointed out, bandwidth with, in her case, two children home with doing schoolwork, uh, her home working and her husband as well. And so when you're looking at bandwidth, um, some people have spotty internet. It goes in and out. We noticed that even prepping for this presentation. So it may make sense to save your synchronous interactions for things that are critical. It, you could make a video of yourself demonstrating some techniques. If you wanted to have your students demonstrate those for you, that would be a good use of synchronous learning, assuming they had the space to do it and someone to work on. Um, but moving into the asynchronous environment, it will end up being a bit more user friendly for a lot of content. So asynchronous learning, again, it's, it's at a different time. People are not working at the same time. There tends to be a, a lag of, um, of interaction. And so um, I did, I, I worked and I ran online programs for eight years in higher ed uh, in academic health sciences. And one of the things that we evolved with our adjunct faculty in the online program was setting up learning that was consistent over a period of time and having multiple types of assignments or things for the students to do that were consistent that they could complete in stages. So if your class meets three days a week for three hours, encouraging your students to create a schedule and to be online three days a week for a length of time, knowing that they're maintaining that habit, but they're also getting that interleaving of learning. And so things to think about are encouraging your students to uh, manage their time as best they can um, and be consistent, but also for reluctant learners, it's really hard to motivate people sometimes. So that's something that you want to keep in mind with keeping contact with your students. And then the other thing is for faculty, if, if you or your faculty are online all the time, getting burnt out is there's a higher risk for that, I think, when people are stressed. So something to consider is establishing an office hour where your faculty are available for an hour every day whether students want to Skype, whether uh, they're you know sitting online. I used to sit online in our um, in our virtual um, uh, our, our video conferencing area for my students every Wednesday from I think 12 to 2. 
And anybody who had a question could join during office hours, could call me in my office, and that just gave an established time that they absolutely knew I was going to be there. And so uh, having that boundary will help your faculty from feeling like they have to be available 24 seven because students might be calling at odd hours, especially if they have to do their learning at a time that's gonna be different because their, you know, their kid or their husband needs to use the computer. So in, in looking at the asynchronous format, that's a part that does take a little bit more of a run up, but that's where active learning can be really, really useful. Virginia, um, could you speak to uh, the flipped classroom? We've had a comment from Susan Beck, longtime educator. Thank you. Also, very active chats going on, so feel free to participate if you're uh, if you'd like. But if you could speak to the flipped classroom, one of the examples she gave was of uh, students actually videotaping themselves and then sending that in. Could you speak to the concept of a flipped classroom? Uh, it's, I'm so glad you brought that up, uh, and so thank you, Sue. Um, so asynchronous learning really is, it's a flipped classroom. And the whole idea of a flip is to have students engage in something and prepare before they come to class. So I will say I have a hard time with this concept because my high school was set up to do exactly that, and we just thought that was learning. We thought the rest of the world was like that. But with a, so a, an example of a flipped classroom concept that we used, um, in, in many of the courses that I've taught is we had what I call a micro lecture and our lecture for the week or the module was up to 15 minutes of content and the 15 minutes of content, the students needed to listen to the lecture and then the students needed to engage in an activity more later. Once they engaged, they intended the lecture, engaged in the activity, then we brought students together in a discussion and the students shared about that activity and that's really where a lot more of the learning happened. And so, you know, if the aim, and I, I keep hearing this from massage, uh, folks in the massage community, a lot of our focus right now is on video, 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 C, 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 and know that there really are other ways to, to hear from students and have students do activities, so they're still bringing a lot more to the party. Another thing I'll say is that in this type of environment, it, it takes a lot longer to learn because you can only listen to one person at a time. So uh, it, that's, and that means reading a course discussion or engaging with somebody. So it really does, um, if, you're a, if you're a person who's used to demonstrating, you know, talking about techniques in class, demonstrating them and have students do, it, it's gonna take a little creativity to work away from that and in a different direction. But, but I can guarantee if you embrace this, you're, you're gonna learn a lot more strategies. So, so thanks for that question. Um, okay, so here, here's a big one, assessments and testing. So um, obviously <laughs> if the assessment is giving a massage to a certain client and getting a grade for that, everybody's gonna encounter those challenges. But remember the dental students, the dental students are gonna have the same difficulty. So you know, just kind of keep that in the back of your head. For other types of testing, um, testing is very easy to do online if you haven't done it. One of the things to, so and, and for your didactic course content, this will work practically seamlessly, I think. Um, so you can set up tests and quizzes online on the retail options as well as through um, the, the, the um, learning management systems that are in place at schools. And so um, timing for tests is really important. And if you have tests scheduled for the next couple of weeks, you might want to push that back a little bit uh, to give students a little extra time to, um, you know, just to get used to things. But another thing about timing for tests is uh, making sure that you are doing the um, uh, adding in um, your formative assessments uh, prior to your summative assessments. So giving students the options to even take quizzes for no credits gets them used to the environment and, and keeps them on track. So it, it just keeps them engaged in learning. One big challenge in timing of tests is offering students flexibility to say the quiz or the test will open, let's say hypothetically, at noon on Thursday and it will close at noon on Friday. And allowing them that time to log in, take the quiz or test, it never really works well synchronously and close out of it. And, and what's essential for that is if technology malfunctions, um, uh, that's really going to be key and there's always a student every time I've done a test like that someone always their internet drops out and and it, you're able to reset it for them. 
one challenge if you have any students who require special accommodations and that students typically get either a time and a half or double time for a test. I have, uh, and if anybody has solutions, please feel free to share. But the best I've heard from several departments that I've asked is have the student take the test at a different time so you can extend their time. And uh, it, there, uh, most of these technologies don't have a way to allow one learner a, a longer amount of time at the same time someone else is taking the test. So probably what you also don't want to do is mail a test to some students and not, you know, have them take it hard copy and have others take it online. So really think about trying to be consistent with this. Um, and Virginia, you bring up a good point. I just wanted to emphasize that you spoke about collaboration and to reach out to other schools, other teachers, other educators that you know, to ask how are they dealing with this? That's something that's been um, a big theme in, uh, so far in the feedback we've gotten. I'd also like to, just in this moment, invite people to take a stretch break. Um, you have been awesome in listening to us. And I just wanna let you know we're in the home stretch here. Just a few more, just a few more slides. And uh, next we're gonna be talking about the learning curve uh, of, this, um, of these challenges. Back to you, Virginia. Okay, thanks for that reminder. I, I keep looking at the clock and like, oh my gosh, we still have a ton of material. But hopefully, I just wanna also say, hopefully the fact that you're here and what we're presenting to you I sincerely hope that it's useful. So now moving on to the funny about online testing is students often ask, is it open book? Well, how would you know? They're online. So um, setting up your test and knowing that the students, they're gonna use their resources. And so allowing that, but structuring your test so that either it limits the amount of time they have to run and look something up, or um, creating more um, critical thinking type questions so that they have to think more rather than just recall information. Um, and so peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer grading is one of the things that uh, it, it, rears its, it rears its ugly little head, I'm sorry, ugly little head in higher ed pretty frequently. And I would encourage you to be really cautious about running to peer-to-peer -peer grading rather than doing grading for your students on your own. Um, especially for faculty who are stressed. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer grading, when it doesn't go well, can really lead to a lot of student dissatisfaction, and it can lead to a lot of uh, uh, petitions for appeals and things like that. So be cautious. Peer-to-peer -peer review of assignments and feedback is great because it engages the students with each other. And if you do have group assignments, balanced participation, you're gonna encounter the same problems. Excuse me while I touch my face. Uh, shouldn't do that. Um, but uh, balanced participation, uh, it, it's gonna be the same problems whether you're doing face-to-face -face or you're doing something online. Um, and then in, in terms of whether it's assessments or testing or any kind of interaction, confidentiality for your students, it, it's really gonna be important. And then confidentiality of material. So if you are going to use a discussion to give students general feedback on an exam, let's say, making sure that you're not directly quoting from a student's paper or student's answer in a way that's identifiable. So it really, it, it's really incumbent upon you and your faculty to manage that confidentiality. Um, so the learning curve, I really, I, I love that Jody was able to find this, uh, uh, this example, but uh, the learning curve is, um, it, it's a learning curve. And that's what it is. And this is the reality. And this is where we are right now. And so um, just, just, be positive and keep going. But it's finding your way around, managing time, academic integrity, and I'm gonna give a shout back to Dawn and say, you know, for schools that don't have an academic integrity policy for students to sign, put a little post-it note somewhere that after this is all over, you're gonna revisit that again and make sure that you have one. Because I think we all think about, oh, there's no need for academic integrity in giving a massage. Well, you know, no, but when you're starting to look at having students write up cases, then that's an area where you wanna think about that. Um, and then there's two resources here on this uh, the screen. Um, uh, if you have unexpected costs, uh, Journey Ed and Academic Superstore. If you have an, um, an email address with an edu ending to it, or if you have a school ID, or I think if you can get a note from your employer, 
Um, if you are at an institution of higher education, which you are because you're massage therapy educators, they have really great discounts on software. I've never found great discounts on computers, but, um, but certainly on software and other things to support you. Um, jumping back up to privacy and confidentiality, the online learning environment is really hearing from each student at a time in an identified way. And what you will find as people get used to it is students who are reluctant to speak up in class may be more likely to give thoughtful answers when they're responding to a discussion and, uh, and the, the, the flip might happen. Um, but in looking at, at privacy and confidentiality, when your online component of your course finishes, it really is best practices to close down that class, close the classroom door and move on. And the retail options are not set up that way. They're very much set up like um, membership entities that happen to offer a class. And so some people keep them open forever and you wouldn't really do that in a real classroom. And that's, we're really speaking to that classroom for massage students. So letting students, uh, you know, we all have said something stupid in an online class that very glad we don't have to go back and look at that later. You know, if it's in a real class, face to face classroom, it's a different environment. So really just making sure that students are in a safe learning environment. And then again, encouraging and empowering uh, both students and faculty to, you know, keep everything going and, and keep everybody together. Um, <clears throat> so uh, don't learn to do, but learn in doing. So that's something that Jody dug up for us, and I'm very thankful for that. This next section is going to get a little into the weeds about, uh, you know, those of you who are, are all set up and you're putting things together, it's just going to introduce some learning options. And this is where I think if we can create a way for to have you within the Alliance interact with each other and share ideas, I, I really think this is going to be helpful. But if we look at the roadmap, in, in getting people oriented and getting people running up to interacting, starting out with low stakes assignments, starting out with low graded, no graded exercises, uh, worksheets, games, things like that, just to keep some kind of content contact going. I, I've heard from friends in uh, the Teach in the Humanities that they have students who are just going to drop out and give up because they don't know really how to engage. And so, you know, that's not what we want for anybody here. We really want to just ride through the storm. Um, one definite easy thing, as previously mentioned, is your didactic material really lends itself to being able to put it online so that um, you can uh, take students through, uh, through complicated concepts. What's really nice, if you create micro lectures, I had a student tell me this one time. She said, what's really nice is I can listen to your lecture two or three times. And then I can go back and look at the slide. So that so that's something that's helpful. I did have a student who used to download MP3s onto her phone and listen to course lectures while she walked the dog because she wanted to hear it before she saw it, before she did anything. So um, another thing to keep in mind is uh, back when I was teaching in a massage program, we had a snow day and or too many snow days actually. And I had to take my pathology course and turn it into some kind of online something so the students could engage with the material. And I took my three hour lecture and I sat down and I recorded it in 35 minutes. And I went, well, clearly I missed a couple slides. So I deleted that, recorded it again. And I realized that when I'm not checking the temperature of the classroom, when I'm not asking for questions, it really is possible to just sort of vomit everything out there. And then the students can again go through that in bite-sized portions. So uh, just think about that in, you know, it, it, and the didactic material can become much more useful. And then critical thinking. So we want to actually take the students to this idea of integrating concepts. And this is going to really be, I think, for everyone, the challenge you're perceiving is how do you take all of this information and put it all together in a way that we're not going to be putting our hands on people. And so there are definite ways to find stop gaps to go through, but thinking about this roadmap, it, it really, it, it's really going through what your program set up and, and what your syllabus is leading you to. So um, moving next into communication for active learning, establish ground rules. I can't say this enough. For your faculty, one question is who gets their phone number? You know, do you really want faculty to be giving their phone number out to students? Do faculty want to do that? You know, does anybody have time to go out and get a dedicated Google Voice number and so on and so forth? Um, and my other question is, 
why is there a need for that? So um, thinking about using uh, your courses just the same way you'd use them in the classroom, having some type of online office hours is not going to make your faculty feel henpecked. Um, and it's not really going to kind of violate, for lack of a better term, their privacy. Um, for course discussions, uh, a real popular thing for people to do is to, uh, and I'll mention this in another slide or two, throw one case up on the slide and ask students to solve it. And then once one student solves it, no one else can participate. So, um, and, and, uh, and then another best practice is to require students to participate twice in discussions. And sometimes there really is nothing to say. So right now, using course discussions just as a way to connect and extract thoughts and engage in a dialogue and having faculty really model and be active in that dialogue can be really useful. Um, professionalism. So in no bad words, proper punctuation, uh, not doing this thing that I see online, slapping an article or reference up there and saying, here's a reference without telling people why you're giving that reference. And then closing the classroom, which I previously mentioned. So um, a, a suggestion for all of you, and again, this is really applying to online, is that the course stays within the course. So when you're having discussions, creating discussion forums, if you're having webcam um, interactions, if there's no reason to tape them, there's no need to tape anything. Um, and that way, the students' privacy and faculty privacy is maintained. Uh, I have heard, by the way, people who are working from home are sharing pictures of their pets. I will not share a picture of my dog over here, but he was snoring a little while ago. You might have heard him. Um, but Anyway, but, you know, for student webcams, uh, you know, just, just making sure that when you're having that face-to-face -face interaction, if, if there's any reason to tape students, let them know why they're being taped and what's going to happen to that tape and what's going to happen to it after the course is over. Um, when students are reaching out to faculty, oftentimes if they're shy about the online environment, they, um, well, they either will people say, I, I don't want to be on my webcam. I don't want people to, you know, to, to see me on the webcam, or I'm going to reach out by phone because then they'll want to hear my question, or I'm going to email. And so I've had students do that in years past. And whenever anybody emails or sends a question via chat, I always ask them to please ask this in the course. So when I had set up online courses, and again, this is way down in the weeds, I, um, in the organization of the course, I had just a, what I call the help forum. And when students had a question that didn't have anything to do with our active discussion, that was where I asked them to ask the question and have the other students be free to answer the question if they knew the answer. So that's kind of good for general administrative sort of stuff. Um, and then document posting. Um, and so if students are submitting assignments to you, put them in your course, in your online course. If students start putting uh, documents, they start emailing things and they start sending things through Google Suite or Office 365, it really can get out of hand very quickly. So I can't stress enough to really set up parameters and be firm about where you want material and discussions to go. And that will keep everybody's lives running much more smoothly. Um, and then also when you're setting up assignments, look at, you know, back to Bloom's taxonomy, and I'm not even sure if this is a new one or the old one, but this one came from Vanderbilt. But the idea that, you know, topics like A and P, uh, a lot of what we need students to do is just remember. And, and, and just be able to regurgitate information back rather than coming back to, I mean, as a researcher, my favorite on Bloom's taxonomy is analyzing. And so it's this idea of how do I connect information from different sources and really make a decision based on that. And, and, and so coming all the way back up to create, and I will tell you, I know we're running up towards an hour, but, but I, I promise you in just a second, I will give you my personal favorite way to teach students ever. Uh, but looking back at Bloom's taxonomy and just making sure that if your program is kind of on pause, you, you fit your assignments and fit your activities to fit where you want the students to be in this pyramid. Um, so so here's, here's my favorite, and my favorite is virtual clients. Um, and so if you have the opportunity to interact with students in real time, you can have them role play. And you can have them role play with your clinic documentation. And this role play really is, it's with a caveat because it's funny when you first start doing it. 
but it can be really useful. And so uh, one of the things that, um, that I've done consistently, I used to teach interdisciplinary students. And so what I would have them do is I would have them write the cases and students would take turns writing and presenting different cases. And they could write cases or use your clinic documents to come up with a scenario and then really role play in real time or, or asynchronously to work their way through the problem solving of con didactic content all the way through working with the client. There is a way to really, in, after you know, the initial giggles are all aside, really work on professionalism, really work on integrating material, and, and even the power of visualization. This is used extensively in, in artistic performance and in sports. Have students visualize, have them write down a whole treatment that they would do and visualize themselves doing it. And that's really down to these strokes, moving this here, moving there. Um, it, it actually, it's a really interesting motor activity. And then encourage reflection. Don't rely totally on, on reflection, but encourage reflection um, just to make sure that students are making the connections you want to make. And so all this can be done discussions or real time. So um, case-based learning, uh, as previously mentioned, uh, I heard this a lot from medical students actually, that you know, guest lecturers would put online that say, here's the case, and one student would solve the case, and it was usually the eager beaver, and nobody else could participate, and the rest of the class got you know, dinged because they didn't participate in the discussion. So um, using well, other ways- Well, speaking of eager beavers, I'm gonna jump in here for just a moment, um, <laughs> Virginia. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge that we're, we're knocking on the four o'clock Eastern Standard Time hour, and we do absolutely respect your time and your participation. I thank you so much for all the chat messages. Uh, for those of you who are interested to see them, the little balloon cloud that looks like this balloon cloud on our slide is up in your upper right hand corner and you can open your chat window to see uh, links and the discussion that's going on about these topics. Um, for those of you who have the option to stay with us, uh, we will continue. We have about 10 more slides to go through uh, and we will move that along on your behalf. So thanks so much. The Alliance for Massage Therapy Education is here to serve you to, to serve you, um, to give you up-to-date information, lots of options as you're hearing. And uh, we just appreciate so much um, your time and your um, participation this afternoon. So thank you for those who can hang in there and uh, love and peace to those of you who need to check out. Back to you, Virginia. And and thanks, Jody, for that. So I, I can definitely talk faster, but... <laughs> Um, but, you know, we will keep going if you can continue with us. Um, so wiki collaborations, uh, if you have not used these, they exist in many LMSs and it is the opportunity for any student to edit a page. And so uh, it's the opportunity for them. You can you can start a wiki and, and change it as you go through maybe week to week uh, or, or module to module, uh, but have students add relevant information about precautions and contraindications, assessments that they might use, especially if you're using case-based learning. So presenting a case, having students collaborate, um, and then also perhaps having the whole class come up with a treatment plan and edit that treatment plan. And so that really gets us into critical thinking. Have students write and present cases. And so uh, this, is, this is kind of the big thing I had in my back pocket that worked tremendously with interdisciplinary learners. And that's what I call massage humanities. And, and that includes pop culture resources. So uh, what I have used in the past is, you know, if you write cases, you write them with the tricks and the traps that everybody can follow and find. And I have a whole textbook that's got that introduction to every single chapter, and most chapters has a case. But uh, if you look at having students write a case and having them rotate presenting a case, if they use it based upon a character, authors are brilliant at fleshing out characters. So I've taught entire courses where the students' cases had to be from biographies, published biographies, or other courses that they could be from television or film or other courses from novels. And that way there's something traceable and you can actually have students model that. So uh, my, my example is if you, if you have your role play and you have the student who's modeling and they've written the case and they say, uh, my name is Lady Macbeth, I'm having trouble sleeping, my husband's about to lose his job and I'm really worried and you know, I'm walking in my sleep and I need a massage because. And so it's kind of charming when you first work your way through that, but then if you know who Lady Macbeth is, you have some context for that. So 
so it really does help students be real and also remember that whatever happens after that, it's it, you have to make assumptions when you're using case-based learning in any type of environment. So uh, use that as you can, just like you would in clinic. And then small groups for problem solving activities. And so it's information literacy, it's research evidence, and don't limit that just to COVID-19, but really look at the other the topics that you would be teaching anyway for your students. Um, and then have students debate, compare and contrast different treatment approaches. If you really have them in clinic and they're trying to discover whether they're gonna be using um, reflexology or, or, or something else. And then collaborative work, sharing documents across client records. So fake client records, so we're not violating um, uh, client confidentiality, but having students work in small groups. And, and it really helps them engage with each other at a time when faculty can be off to the side doing other things. Um, and so you know, all of that really is, it lends itself to critical thinking and problem solving. And then evidence-based work, and you know, I know it's me, and I, you know, I'm a researcher, but have them extract information from research articles. And um, the other thing is, if you really need some time, and you're going to have students be doing research papers, I don't think any of you have students doing research, but you can actually, they can sign up for, I think it's free for most of it, Elsevier's Researcher Academy, and it really just teaches you nuts and bolts about research. And you also can, and this is great for community college folks, um, you can have your students take the city program training for human subject research. It's a, it's a two tutorial aimed at researchers, but it has a whole lot of useful information. And then uh, last but not least, an evidence-based work, an easy way to make this uh, on a small scale um, is to, if you're comparing and contrasting modality approaches, you can certainly do that, but you can also do uh, ask me three handouts and if you don't know what this program is just look it up it was, it was started by the institute for patient safety or patient safety institute and it was boiling down uh what patients when they needed to ask questions a framework and so all of that really draws students into evidence and gets them using resources and so um, here on this slide, and again, this will be, uh, yeah, I think these are in the chat, but these will be sent back to you. This is a, a list of you know, open access articles for massage therapy educators. And so that can kind of help, you know, if you don't have this in your program, it can certainly help you put material together. Um, I think we're coming close to the end, um, but I wanted to make another suggestion. And this comes from my brother-in-law who is working in a museum. Uh, he's a museum educator. And uh, they use virtual field trips and they actually make those available to schools around the country to, uh, to K-12 schools. But you could create an opportunity to have, you know, maybe your alumni who are at practices or clinics do a little film of walking the students through their office and maybe talking about the types of clients that they had. And the same with local employers. A lot of people right now we hear are, are not going to be able to be working or kind of scaling down work, but certainly taking a tour helps your program make connections with the community. And then working on practice building resources, uh, so business course content if you can shift, and then analyzing, analyzing the community that your students are gonna be working in. And so um, analyzing community demographics, what the health related issues are, massage opportunities, all of that's, that's content that can be added into your course. And so I'm gonna toss back over to Jody for some final thoughts. And your mic is not on, Jody, so if we we can't hear you. Thank you. I've been doing so much typing. I didn't want you to hear the click, 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 click as I was uh, typing in the chat. Thank you guys so much for all the ideas that you have shared. It really demonstrates uh, to me a concept that Don and Hogan and I were talking about. And Don, do you remember that uh, uh, that thought about uh, you reaching, saying that people should reach out to each other? Mm hmm. Yeah, and you know, like you said, Jody, I've just been like entranced with all of the comments in the chat box and really just um, appreciating all the suggestions and input and feedback everyone's been sharing. And I think this may be the silver lining to this emergency alarm situation we're in is that it does provide us a way to connect as a community. And really, even though we might be socially distanced from each other, we can still connect maybe in a greater way than we ever have in terms of sharing our resources and our knowledge. And, you know, even from a compliance standpoint, we are really in a place where there's wide leeway for schools to um, make accommodations as needed and really demonstrate a lot of adaptability and ways that they can um, just, you know, uh, work outside the normal 
box. Um, so yeah, I, I remember that distinctly as we were talking. And I don't know if you've seen um, the videos from some places in Italy where people are out on their balconies and they're singing and they're dancing and they're finding ways again to connect with each other, even though they might be um, in their own homes. I don't know. To me, that just reflected a really positive aspect of what we're all experiencing globally. So um, thank you so much for your facilitation and all the people and their great comments. Yeah. Yeah. And so guys, go ahead and reach out. And now and then I hear that people feel like they're, they don't want to reach out to their competition. Guys, gals, there is no competition. There is only creation. And I say this to school owners uh, all the time that there is no competition. Your program is going to attract the type of students that are going to do best in your program. Don't worry about other people's program, but use this as an opportunity to support one another. And we have just seen the generosity flowing in the, the chats as far as what, um, what people are doing, what they've had success at. Um, and thank you guys so much for being here. I want to give a shout out um, to Susan Beck, to Whitney Lowe, and to Sandy Fritz, uh, who are all, um, all listening along with you guys. And so as an educator, coming together as a school owner, as a program director, when you come together in a webinar like this, just know you are not alone, that we are all dealing with the same hurdles. And you'll see the picture on this slide that's still up, and it says, you know, your plan, a nice straight line to the finish line, right? And then reality, right? How it actually goes. And so we've presented you today with the best case, uh, the best options that we know of to support you in this minute, in this day, uh, for the next week, for the next three weeks. Uh, some people are reporting in the chat that their schools haven't been suspended. In Texas, they're still, they're still open for business. By comparison, Washington State knows they're going to be closed until April 24th. So do reach out to your colleagues. Use this as a time to fortify and strengthen um, your relationships and your program. And also stretch. Part of what we heard from Virginia was go ahead and you know stretch and use these Udemy or Coursera uh, platforms that maybe you haven't had a chance to do that before. That's what we would offer you know, for you as really to find the fun in this process. So uh, I will ask my co-presenters, both Virginia and Dawn, for any final thoughts. Couple of final thoughts, and uh, one actually, I, I finally got a chance to look at the chat, and someone had asked a little further up. They are uh, had tried to get approval or were seeking approval to have students meet in small groups, and I did see someone ask online, "Well, what happens? Could we just meet someplace else off-site?" And again, be cautious. If you're in an area that has high rates of infection, high risk of infection, uh, make sure that you 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 follow the lead of other types of programs, especially if you're going to be meeting with students off-site, there are liabilities there, not just related to exposure, but liabilities just in general of property and casualty. Um, so that's something to think about. The other thing that we hadn't really planned in putting this together, and, and I'm hoping we can do this, and I guess we probably need to run this past the board and Naomi, but is to do kind of a program evaluation for all of you to connect you together, because we know that there were some people who just couldn't get signed up. This is, I thought we'd have 20 people here. Uh, we did have quite a few people sign up that didn't make it today. But um, doing just a follow-up evaluation to find out from you what resources the Alliance can provide for you. And it might you know, even be our own online discussion someplace where we can share information um, you know, for the benefit of the membership and really start to build our resource directory, which we've been working to get back online for a while now. And it's really, um, it's, it's more uh, materials than it is anything else. So it's probably not going to be tremendously helpful right now. Um, but, but so if you could, if you do get an evaluation form from us, please fill that out and let us know how we can be of help and then reach out. I, you know, I'm easy enough to find on social media. Uh, I do this kind of work for a living. So it's a, uh, in terms of consulting and doing education. But, uh, you know, I think any of us would be happy to be resources for you and just stay connected.
And so as we wrap up, I've been given um, some additional information about when this video is going to be available for you. Uh, to process this video uh, could take as long as 24 hours. So we're looking at delivering this video to you on Monday at the latest Tuesday so that you can review it. And, um, and for those of you who took notes who want to maybe review certain topics, you can be expecting the video portion of this on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, and so my name is Jody Scholes. My co-presenters are Dr. Virginia Cohen and uh, Don Hogue from the Executive Director of Compta. We want to thank you from the bottom of our heart, from a heartfelt thank you for being with us today. Uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you. We look forward to serving you uh, through the Alliance for massage therapy education and uh, through Compta. So best of luck as you navigate these new waters and stay in touch. Have a great afternoon and a great weekend. We're signing off from the Alliance. Have a great day.